Hey students, so let's take a look at lesson 14, configuring shared resources. So first of all, this is where we start to experience the real advantage of creating a local area network or even being part of a network at home in the fact that, you know, one of my greatest examples, and we'll talk about this towards the end of the lecture, is printers. You know, certainly you've got five people in your household. Um, all of them want to print. Does that mean I have to buy five printers? No, it just means that I need to share the printer that I have and create the back-end resources, opening some things up on the firewall, etc., to share those resources. And of course, this holds true in a corporate environment. COCC, for example, is a corporate environment. Imagine the cost to students if we had to put an individual printer next to every workstation here on campus. So we're going to start with the basics. So First of all, we'll look at, you know, configuring that sharing. So sharing files and folders. Um, always a good idea because what we don't want to do, you know, back in the day when we shared a file or folder, it meant sticking it on a floppy disk and doing what's called sneaker netting, putting your sneakers on and walking it over to who needs it. They used it, make changes, and then bring it back to you. So hugely inconvenient. That's where networks, uh, you know, really gain their traction, that and security. So... You know, first of all, folder sharing in Windows 8, you know, we have home group, we have public folder sharing, and any folder sharing. So home group, simple to set up. Yeah, they've made this really seamless. We'll go take a brief look at it. Public folder sharing, so by default, you know, on a non-domain administrator, uh, domain computer, we have this thing called a public folder, and, and we're going to look at actually Windows 10. They've moved that public folder into the OneDrive. And that makes sense. Um, so, and then any folder sharing, you know, preferable for no large networks, Windows domain networks. Yeah, this is where we're going to really take all of the files and folders from the local desktops and throw them on a file server and share specific files and folders with people who need them, such as by department or by user. Okay. So, sharing features. Any folder sharing, you can go through these, you know, shares files from any location. Public would, you know, place all shared files in a single location. And that makes sense, the public folder. Um, so they got to be in the public folder to be shared with the public folder sharing, of course. <laughs> and then the home group, you know, shares files from default library locations. So what are we talking about on library locations? Well, let me bring up my Windows 10 machine and we'll look at libraries. So if you notice under this PC, we have some default things. Now, in the old days, we had the My Documents, and things like music, pictures, and videos were under there. However, the issue with that is if I shared My Documents, I was sharing everything. So if I right-click on this, okay, and say Include in Library, I can see the default items, okay, that are libraries. And so the cool thing is I can share all of these libraries or some, as we'll see in just a few minutes. So let's go back to the presentation here. There we go. And again, I'd, I'd encourage you to pause this and, and go through this a little bit, understand the differences, you know, who are we sharing with, how are we sharing with, etc. So home groups. You know, using home groups, you know, you can share their documents, printers, pictures, music. This has been expanded in Windows 10. In Windows 8, these are the things we share, you know, in a home group. So, um, you know, home network is already read-only. How do we do that? It's really pretty simple. In the fact that if I come back over here, and I'll simply come down here. It would be the same in a Windows 8 machine. Let me get in the active box here. There we go. And I just type in home. It should ring up the home group. We'll go in the home group. You see currently there is no home group. So I would have to create a home group. From here I can choose, you know, what it is that I want to share with the home group. Okay. Now if you notice here something to quickly look at is when we're on a private network, our firewall is going to open more feature and functionality by default. It's going to turn on network discovery. It's going to, you know, turn off uh, file and print sharing. We can go ahead and change that. If we want to share a printer, we're going to, you know, or files, we're going to turn that on, etc. If we come down here to public, we'll see that things are off. All right, so that when we're on a public network, 
our machine is not going to be available to be found if somebody happens to you know come and search networks okay so if, you know somebody comes down here to the network icon um, they're not going to be able to find you know anything here they're not going to be able to find our machine now as you can see i've got a virtual machine it's added to my machine so that's why it would show up let's go back to the presentation so you know relatively limited yes they're designed to be but they're designed to be easy to set up because basically um well let's take a look at libraries first so you know open file explorers we did we saw that you know certain things are included in that library under this pc we can add our own folder so one time, you know, I had a library that I briefly shared of software, okay, so that um, my kids could go in and get their Acronis backup software. So I just shared a library. So notice on Windows 8, we have this libraries tab, and we're going to find the default libraries, the documents, music, pictures, and videos uh, located there. Pretty simple. Adding a library, well, you know, we go up to library tools, you know, we'll pick what we want to add. We can also associate certain folders within these specific libraries. So for example, the music folder is pointing towards the default music folder, okay? Um, and if you don't put your music in there, let's say in my case, I use iTunes, and under the iTunes directory is my music folder. Well, I can just have that folder, okay? Um, you know, set save location or have that folder included in that library. Sorry about that. Background noise from the IT guys cleaning out computers. So adding library locations. Again, you know, my documents public. We can go in and add library locations. Choose the location we want to add and go for it. So creating a home group, really easy. You know, system does not detect a home group. The networking and sharing center control panel contains a link providing access to create a home group. So we literally go in and say, hey, I want a home group. You know, what kind of home group do I want? You know, so we go into the network location, you know, public, private, etc. That'll take us to the home group. Currently, as you can see, there's not one. So we can just simply create a home group. And when we do that, we then get to choose what we're going to include. OK, so if you as you see here in creating this home group, at least by default, we're not going to share my documents. I will share my pictures, videos, music, and printers, and devices. So, you know, one of the great things is at home, in a home network, you might consider having a media server that can be, you know, a simple old laptop, for example, that you could set up a home group, put all your pictures, videos, etc., over there, have that printer connected to it if it's a local printer or a network printer that people can reach. We'll talk about printers here in a bit. So at that point, you're going to get, you know, a password. This is what you're going to need to share with people who want to join the home group. So they're going to need that password. So this is much easier than it used to be where we actually had to do the whole shared folder thing, go over to the other computer, create um, user accounts on the computer. We have the shared folder on. I, if we were dealing with a peer-to-peer -peer without a server, we had to create a user account so that we could give them access to that share on, say, our machine. So joining a home group, pretty easy. Go down to the home group. You know, it finds a home group. You say, join now. You enter that password that we got. Bing, bang, boom, you're in the home group. So once you've joined, computer to a home group, shared libraries of the other computers on the network up here in the Explorer. So notice here, here's an example. We've got a couple different computers that are sharing. We have Workstation E, Workstation F. Um, they're both sharing the same thing. So on the home group, these two machines are sharing information. So we're going to, each time we join a computer, choose what's going to be shared off that computer. So, you know, and we get in, you know, we decide what we're sharing, and it shows up in the shares. So public folder. So uh, using the public folder is the simplest way to give your clients file sharing capability. Yeah, it is. 
Um, public folders are used in corporations, but they tend to be used for general information only. So we're not going to use the public folder for HR stuff, for example. You know, this might be stuff that just everyone needs to get at and in doing security, even John Q. Public, we won't mind if John Q. Public was to walk into our organization, connect his computer, and see the public folder. So keep in mind of what we put in there. Okay. Now, some small businesses will use the public folder because they were set up by folks who didn't really understand the security principle behind it. It was just easy way to do it. We turned on sharing to anyone with network access, can read and write files in the public folders. Can you see? Can you can you see why this might be a security risk for us here? You know, sharing a folder pretty easy to share a folder. Okay, let me give you a quick example. We'll run back to our Windows 10 machine. I'm going to go ahead and go out to the local drive here, and I will create a new folder that I'm going to share, and I'll call this new folder. Why not shared folder? So there's my shared folder. I'm going to right click. I'll go to properties. And if you notice here, I have a sharing tab. Go to the sharing chat tab. I can choose share. I can give it a share name. So shared folder on you know, my machine, whatever the case may be, and share it out. So if you notice it's shared here, okay, shared folder, it's done. Let's close this out and now that folder is shared let's go back into properties and take a look sharing you notice the network pass so it's you know desktop you know so that's the by the way that's the default name that was given to this PC and it's a shared folder I can certainly go into advanced sharing I'm sharing this folder what's the name shared folder you know comments I can go in and give permissions now Here's the thing with permissions, I'm sharing a local folder, so only people with local permissions on my machine are going to be able to access it, right? So I would need to go ahead and literally create someone, an account on this computer that gives them access to this folder, and then what they could do is through networking, they would see, and you know, they would come in um, if, if, let's say, they were on another machine. So here's that desktop, right? So as an example of this sharing, um, here is my computer. So remember that the uh, Windows 10 machine we're looking at is a virtual machine and they're NATed. So, you know, they're both able to communicate. So here's that, that desktop. So if we go in here and I'll pause this while it looks up that shared folder. And so what you see is right here is the shared folder down here. So, you know, here I am. I'm in the shared folder, clicked on it. And of course, I, I haven't put anything in it, but I'm connected via that machine. So let me drag this off here. We'll go back to the presentation and we'll continue on. So again, you know, the biggest thing is what are users allowed to do with these shared folders? You know, um, so again, you know, like users, what they can do, we can share this folder. That's what I just showed you. We're sharing the user folder. It shows a shared and then, of course, managing shares. So, you know, must have user accounts on the sharing computer unless it's a domain. So, you know, understand with the domain controller, all of those user permissions are sitting on a server called the domain controller. We manage all the users together much more efficient in a large network environment. Um, I would say it's much more efficient in any environment that has more than eight people working in it um, to have a little server, whether it be a domain controller, most of the time we might put in a, a small business server. Um, but still, the fact that we're using that single server to manage permissions, to manage files and folders, taking them off the local desktop so that we're not having to worry about things disappearing if we lose a local client. Um, so definitely a network is an advantage. So, you know, set, set share permissions, you know, by default, everyone has the read permission. Um, we decide what permissions we want to give them. So share permissions, pretty easy. Read displays, you know, again, pause this. Um, displays folder names, file names. We can execute program files. Change, that's where we get in the ability to append data, um, to create folders, subfolders, etc. Full control. The biggest thing is changing file permissions. So with full control, 
or ownership of a file, we're able to then decide who we want to give permission to. So uh, two types of permissions here that we deal with. So share permissions follow the folder, NTF follow the drive. So NTFS permissions, you know, generally speaking, network administrators prefer to use NTFS um, or share permissions, but not both. Normally, yes, NTFS, what I'll do is I'll, I'll I'll share the folder out, but then I'll use the NTFS permissions. And the reason being the NTFS permissions are much more granular. So there's more flexibility that I gain by managing them via NTFS. Where I get in trouble is if I start doing specific share permissions for people and then go and do different permissions for NTFS, I'm going to run into an issue. So today, of course, we know SkyDrive as OneDrive. Um, you know, default Microsoft cloud-based storage, you know, so we're given a simple folder structure on you know, cloud-based storage service. Every user who applies for an account gets one if we're using a Windows operating system. The cool thing is we can access it through the web. We can go through the desktop icon, you know, or through a desktop application. So, you know, let me get back into my virtual machine here. We'll fire that thing back up. There it is. Well, limit that, and there is my OneDrive. You know, they're referring to it as SkyDrive. So as you can see, the cool thing is, I just put up this Windows 10 virtual machine, and because I logged in with my Microsoft account, it knew I had these folders. It put these folders up, so I can go in here. You know, I can go into the COCC folder. What I'm accessing is what is on the cloud. So the cool thing about this is by having my documents out in the cloud, well, you know, pretty simple. I can access them from different machines. Um, I can access them from my Windows devices, from my tablet, from my PC, and have a single unified place that I'm storing my data. Now, you know, yes, caching these down, you know, so that I can use them offline, the whole nine yards. It's no different than Google Drive, folks. The... Uh, you know, so so SkyDrive or OneDrive, you know, makes it pretty simple to keep a place that we have a single file store. And the cool thing is, yes, we can share that. So we could technically share that with the household. Now, one of the issues with that is if it's on SkyDrive and it's sitting on the cloud and I want to use it, um, let's say I'm storing a bunch of movies or music there, I'm going to be using bandwidth. You know, so keep that in mind, you know, from the web, pretty easy to get to the web based application, too. I don't think I need to demonstrate that. I have permissions for my SkyDrive. And then, of course, I can unlink SkyDrive. So if I'm worried about security, I don't want to use SkyDrive, then I would unlink it. The cool thing is, of course, SkyDrive integrates with all the, the Windows applications, all the Microsoft applications, Word, Excel, etc., so what I can do is go ahead and, you know, call up a Word document, double click on my SkyDrive. It brings up the folder structure and I can save it out to the web. So implementing SkyDrive, pretty easy to do. Um, you know, it's really more integrated now in the fact that it's part of the Microsoft account. So when you're uh, buying a new machine, for example, it used to be we had to set up this this profile on that machine. Now we're really utilizing the web. We're using the Microsoft um, account to authenticate. We don't have to. We can still create a local account when we instantiate a new machine. But the cool thing is then it brings over our SkyDrive and it brings over, you know, our browser history and all that good stuff. So not really sure. I think this is just a concept that they wanted to throw in here. You know, NFC, near, near fuel communication. Let me give you an example of this. Um, I have a barcode reader. It normally sits, you know, in a cradle. It's connected to my computer. I need to be able to use it wirelessly. Well, that's what we're talking about here. Okay. So low speed, which means, you know, not a lot of bandwidth. You know, what am I really passing back when I pass through a, um, a barcode? You know, just a quick series of numbers, right, to identify something. Radio-based communication technology, you know, identification, RFID. So, you know, that's that's the thing with RFID, right, is it is short distance. So, again, not really sure why that was in there, but it was, so we'll move on. Now, here again, here's that cool part 
of the initialization of utilizing a network, whether at home or in an office environment, is if you notice in the classrooms here at COCC, each classroom has one printer and all of the workstations in that classroom can access that printer because that printer is on the network and it's shared. It's managed by a print server, which we'll talk about. So a couple things that are kind of weird when you're talking about Microsoft or Windows print architecture. So the print device, this, this is kind of backwards to me. The print device is the actual hardware. You know, pick it up, put the paper in it, etc. The printer is the software interface through which a computer communicates with a print device. Now, this is not the print driver, okay? This is the printer software, okay? We then have a print server, a computer or standalone device that receives print jobs from clients and sends them to print devices that are either locally attached or connected to a network. So technically, when you share a printer on your local machine, your machine is becoming a print server. It's going to accept the print jobs and then send them out to the printer connected to your machine. Now, this is much easier than it used to be because most printers today are plug and play. And what that means is I'm connecting them via USB if I'm sharing them out, or a lot of printers today have wireless network capabilities. I give them an IP address, they become a node on my network, I search for that node, there's an identifier of what kind of printer it is, my operating system either has the print driver or knows where to go get it, downloads it, install it, bing, bang, boom, I'm ready to print. What is that thing that it downloads? It's downloading the printer driver. So uh, a device driver that converts the print jobs uh, generated by applications into an appropriate string of commands for a specific print device. So here's the thing. I print a Microsoft Word document. It's going to, to convert that into what Word knows as the standard print commands. Well, what if my um, HP, you know, uh, doesn't understand that or my brother doesn't understand that. That's where the driver comes in uh, using PCL5, PCL6 standards. So understanding more about printing. Again, you know, before you can print documents in Windows, you must install at least one printer. Duh. Does it have to be a physical printer? No. Let's go ahead and take a look at the printers. I'm calling this on offline here and then I'll bring it over. So here we go. I'm going to go into my devices and printers. There's my devices and printers right there. And what you see here is my devices. And here are my printers. So if you notice, I have this Photoshop printer. I also have this Adobe PDF printer. Well, that's because I have Adobe PDF. That isn't a physical printer. It's going to print to a PDF file. So keep that in mind. But do I still need a driver? Yes, I do. So you know, when you print a document in an application, you select the printer that you want the destination print job to go to. So here's an example. I've got a workstation. You know, it has a print driver, print server to the print device. So the printer, what they're calling the printer, is what my computer sees it can print to. Okay, so it's going to print to the printer. The print driver is going to convert it. The print server knows because it's either connected device or the print server knows the IP address of a networkable print device and it's able to send it out. Now, the cool thing about a print server, do we need a print server at home? No, not necessarily. Again, I can just share the printer. Sharing a printer is really easy. Um, all you have to do is go in and simply share the printer. Right click on it. And if you notice, I've already shared this one and choose share printer. Let me go over here, right click, um, and like set it as the default. I've already shared this one here, my printer, so it's shared. If I go into properties, you know, I can see all the properties for it, hardware, etc. okay? So by sharing the printer, it's then available. Notice right now it's offline, so I'm gonna get limited functionality, but, um, ah, my son's Xbox One when I'm connected. I'm going to have to go check that out. Anyway, um, lost my train of thought. A print server works better in a corporate environment because essentially with a print server, it is going to know with a shared printer, the person's going to have to get the driver. Okay, Where do they get the driver from? Well, hopefully Windows recognizes it and downloads it 
and creates that printer on their machine and then they're printing to their printer which happens to be the same as my print device. With a print server the cool thing is I can connect these, I can configure the print device here on the print server and I can do it for x86 machines, x64 machines, I can do it for Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 10, all have unique drivers, all would be available here. So the cool thing with that is when a workstation comes in and says, hey, I want to connect to this printer I, that I found locally that's shared or through the network that's shared, it's the print server that they'll get the driver from. So essentially, you know, printing, you know, there's the properties of, say, the XPS printer. Yes, flexibility, because again, you know, connected, uh, you can also connect the computer to a local area network and share the printer with other users. That's the whole advantage of it. Adding a local printer, you'll go through this in your lab. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. it. It really sort of is archaic that, you know, they want to take you through the process of adding a local printer, you know, so they'll run you through all these. You're going to only be able to do an LPT1 because we don't have a printer connected to the device. So, you know, consequently, you know, we'll use the LPT printer, which is a local printer, and we get a bunch of standard printers that the print drivers are already part of the operating system. This is one of the reasons why the operating system is so big, is to make things truly plug and play, the driver needs to be in the operating system. So, you know, give it a name. We then go in, right click the printer, you know, share. We have to make sure, you know, network discovery is on, file and print sharing are on, or else all of our sharing, you know, is for nada, because if people can't see the printer on the network, how are they going to be able to reach it? So to share a printer, we go into sharing, we click the share, we give it a good share name. Notice it'll tell us what drivers are installed. We can go out and install additional drivers. This is what I was talking about. So, you know, not only additional drivers for the x86 to x64 for a single operating system, but also for multiple operating systems that might connect to the printer. So one of the great things that we do need to look at is print security. I'm going to make this really quick, but print security is basically we don't want somebody coming in before their shift, after their shift, printing that ebook that they need to read that's 450 pages on our dime, especially when most likely they're going to find a nice color printer, because wouldn't it be great to have all the pictures and diagrams in color and print that out on our dime? So not only can we keep them from printing things off hours, but most importantly, IT doesn't want to be have to be bugged every time the printer locks up, somebody has to shut it down, there's a print job in there. Even better, somebody accidentally printed or accidentally started to print, War and Peace wants to stop it. It's already printed before IT gets involved, right? Well, if there's a local person sitting next to that printer that's been designated at, with the security principles of managing documents, they're gonna be able to right click on that printer, get in there, Okay, see what, so if you notice by default, everyone has print, you know, we can assign print permissions, but what that person's going to be able to do is get back in there and cancel documents so that it doesn't print or, you know, resume or pause or restart. Another good thing that we can do, you're going to do this in your lab, is we can actually issue priority to certain people so if a printer is heavily used, and this is my boss, I can set priority that when, when she hits the print button, no matter what's in that queue, her document, her print job goes to the front of the line. Does that mean it's going to stop an existing print job? No, it's just going to go in after it. So accessing a, a shared printer, pretty easy to do. Networking sharing, you know, we go in again to network here. If we know it's on a specific workstation that's being shared, great, um, or a server, or we can go in and simply choose to add a printer. So we go into printer and devices, add a printer. If we know the IP address, we know the host name, we can do it that way as well. So again, managing documents, you know, refers to pausing, resuming, restarting, or canceling documents. Mostly it's going to be canceling documents. Something's locked up. Um, we need to reprint. We ran out of paper, we had to replace it, the print job got 
you know, messed up, whatever the case may be. I don't want to print the rest of the job. Uh, maybe it's on a very expensive color printer and, and halfway through, you know, the cyan color went bad. Well, I'll go and cancel the document so that I can rerun it so that I don't have to print the rest of it, use a bunch of ink, for example. So, you know, here's a, you know, managing documents. So here's a test page in there. If I had the ability to manage documents, I could right click, pause, restart, cancel, do whatever the case may be. So, you know, here, go ahead and pause this. You know, here are the things that they can do. You know, pause printing, cancel all documents. You know, so if somebody went in, this happens a lot. Somebody went in and, oh, it's not printing. Oh, it's not printing. Oh, it's not printing. Print, 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 print. Pretty soon that, you know, they've got 13, 14, or seriously, in one case, 15 times it was going to print the same silly print job because they didn't think it was printing because the printer was out of paper. They didn't go look. It just said there was an issue and they continued to hit that magic print button. So managing printers, you know, again, software based. Um, a lot of printers today have a web based interface that we can manage the local printer with the actual print device. So the hardware we can do that, you know, and what we're talking about here is man managing the printer priorities, uh, you know, and then, of course, one of the cool things is with priorities, you know, when is it available? That's what I was talking about. You know, do we spool a job? Do we start with the last page is spooled? You know, it really depends on what kind of jobs we're printing. So, again, another thing is scheduling printer access so that people People are less likely to print those fun things for their kids or, you know, their homework or whatever the case may be during hours because they're afraid of getting caught. So finally, there's the idea of a printer pool and the printer pool requires two identical print devices. But what it does is it provides redundancy at the print level. So if a print device goes down, it's going to shift the jobs over to the other one. If one is busy, it shifts the job over to the one that's not, so both printers can be working. So it's not like we're sitting there with an idle printer waiting for the other one to break down, so we get faster print jobs. Don't see this as much today because printers have really gotten fast. But back when you know printers were just you know five pages per minute on on black and white, or you know okay five pages per minute on color, um, and we had a lot of jobs. Yeah the idea of pooling a, a, a printer was a good idea. Plus, when we take one down for maintenance, people don't stick in the queue. You know, they don't come up and say, oh, the printer's broken. Here's the thing. You never find out a printer's broken until a manager brings it to your attention. So anyway, uh, because it's just inconvenient, they can go back to their desk and say, print over to the other printer, perhaps. So a nice thing, again, with a pool is if one printer goes down, we still have a printer in the pool. Highly efficient way of doing it. So be careful with the home, with the uh, lab on this one. Little tricky about what you're doing with the admin privileges there. So pay close attention to that. Anyway, that is enough lecture for 14. Take care.